We used to call this lecture Mega Projects, uh, but I'm shifting a little bit uh, and calling it, the new title is American Dream Overseas. And before, when it was called Mega Projects, the emphasis was on the, the global economic system and how it favors these enormous <laughs> projects that are bigger than single architectural design projects and more about significant big chunks of cities and in some cases the entire city. Um, if you were a young professional architect graduating at a time of economic hardship, where would you go to practice architecture? Dubai or China. Dubai or China. So let's start with Dubai uh, and look at some of the things um, that have been going on in Dubai. Um, Dubai used to be uh, just a desert uh, with a very low population until they discovered oil in the region and until the, another, another big factor was the uh, embargo against Iran. So basically when Iran wants to import or export something, it goes through Dubai. And in the process, a lot of money changes hands and a lot of money stays in Dubai. Uh, the other thing that's happening is that uh, a, a weird aberration of the global economic system is when you have enormous wealth, you have to do something with that money that allows you to tell the story that 10 years from now, that $10 billion that I personally own is going to be worth $100 billion. And it doesn't have to be a true story. It just has to be believable. And that's what du that's, that reality is what built places like Dubai. There is no need for Dubai. Dubai does not fulfill any direct architectural programmatic necessity. Dubai is unnecessary architecturally programmatically. It is an instrument of financial capital investment. I have lots of money, I need to put it in something, and hopefully it's something real and physical, so that I can tell the story that my $10 billion is going to be worth more than $10 billion 10 years from now. Uh, and so that's the function of Dubai. That's why Dubai looks the way it is. It's not uh, the result of a lot of people saying, oh man, I have to have a condo in Dubai. I have to locate my business in Dubai. I have to move my operations to Dubai. No one is thinking that. The only reason anyone needs to have anything to do with Dubai is as an investment. And so um, they wanted to build a fancy expensive hotel, but they couldn't build a hotel for foreigners on the Arabian Peninsula, the land of Islam. Because you know what foreigners do in luxury hotels. They fornicate. And we can't have that in the land of Islam, so we put it off the coast of the Arabian Peninsula. Thus started the, so cool. the fashion. Uh, and here's a luxury hotel. If you want to visit the lobby, pay $35 and ride off the coast in a limousine across the little bridge to uh, the Burj uh, Dubai, this hotel. Um, one of the most expensive hotels in the world, $5,000 a night or something. Um, and thus began the creation of islands off the coast. And so the hotel was the first thing, and then came luxury condominium and luxury house development off the coast for foreign investment. Uh, a lot of people want to control their own piece of the, the world. They want to control their nation. And if they can't control their nation in reality, they buy the model of their nation uh, in this development here. Um, so it's, um, it's an interesting development model that many students have found uh, worth analysis over the years. Um, this is what Dubai looked like in the early days. And then it developed uh, very rapidly and continues to develop very rapidly. Um, and 
including the tallest building in the world, um, way beyond anything uh, before it. Um, and remarkably, it's at risk of losing its title uh, soon, despite its um, overshoot. Um, if you compare other buildings, the Empire State Building, for example. Why is it doing that? Okay. So moving quickly um, through Dubai, skiing in the desert, why not? Um, the United Arab Emirates, uh, a similarly oil wealthy state looking for something, some viable story it can tell about real estate development. Um, where's this? Shanghai. Uh, a little bit earlier than Dubai. Uh, it, if, if all of this looks a little bit like Las Vegas, there's a reason. So in the 60s uh, and 70s, Robert Venturi gave us learning from Las Vegas. And boy, have we learned from Las Vegas. And uh, no one has learned more from Las Vegas than uh, the wealthy development culture and population of China and the Middle East. Uh, first, China, you see here the ancient city, the first city uh, at this location where the Yangtze River intersects with the South China Sea. So it became an important port of trade. Uh, and this side of the river was where the settlements, the early Chinese settlement, and then the foreign settlement, and this was all rice fields until uh, the opening up of China and Deng Xiaoping deciding to make China a great location for capitalism in the midst of a communist country. And so uh, this district of <coughs> Pudong was opened up. Uh, the financial part of, of Pudong is called Lucia Sui, and it basically, uh, the goal was to make it a global city, a place of exchange uh, of <coughs> great financial wealth. Basically, with the opening up of China, the largest population in the world, they basically said this, um, you want access to Chinese markets, the 1.2 billion people, but more importantly, the 100,000 consumers, or the, which quickly became the 500,000 consumers, which quickly became the 1 million consumers. So as a country of uh, high consumption, uh, which it quickly moved to 10 million consumers, uh, which is a tiny fraction of the population uh, 10 million consumers in China, let's see, that's something, let's call it 1%. 1% uh, 1 of Chinese consumers, 1 billion, 100 million, 10 million, that's a lot of consumers. That's a big market. So you can basically ignore the 1.1 billion people who are not consumers and focus on those uh, 10 to 20 million wealthy Chinese who are consumers. That's a huge market. And so uh, access to Chinese raw materials, access to Chinese uh, labor, and access to Chinese markets came uh, with a deal. Basically, you can have access to these markets uh, if you rent, if you lease space, so sign a long-term lease for real estate in this development. And so it's an artificial uh, stimulation of the economy, an artificial demand for office space that was important to justify the construction of this location. Like Dubai, uh, no one actually lives in Dubai, uh, but all of those towers are leased. Very few of those towers, the space in those towers are occupied, but they are all owned or leased. So it is, that's evidence of a financial arrangement that is independent of any architectural programmatic demand. Um, and the similar thing is Pudong. Someday, these office towers will be filled with people on phones and computers. But uh, for the first few decades, 
they are all leased but not occupied because it is a financial symbolic deal. Architecture, in this case, is serving a symbolic purpose. It is telling the world China is ready for its moment. China is ready to once again become the most important urban civilization as it was a thousand years ago. Uh, it's ready to now dominate because it has the demographic, it has the uh, governmental um, consensus, and it has the resources. And so Shanghai is the cutting edge of that. Um, how did Shanghai become what it is today? Uh, this is, in a way, continuation of the deal we have made as an architecture school and as uh, in the larger context of architectural education where we've said we're not just going to teach the history of Western architecture. We now uh, are stepping up to the plate and teach a uh, history of global architecture. Uh, the assumption for the first few years of teaching the global history of architecture is that it's a matter of doing justice to the proliferation of Western architecture that we've always taught in schools, and then dip in uh, one lecture per culture and say, here's Indian architecture, here's Chinese architecture, here's the architecture of Africa, and uh, as if each of these things are separate branches on the tree of architecture. Um, but it turns out that that's not even true. Uh, we think of globalization in the recent years as being a unique thing that suddenly, because of the internet and global telecommunications and cheap oil, we are suddenly living in an interconnected world. That is partially true, uh, but the implication, the two things that are not true. The first thing that's not true is this is not an even globalization. Globalization is an uneven process. There are winners and losers. There are dominant economies and cultures and subordinate economies and cultures. The United States is the global superpower dominant culture and economic player. Uh, we are quickly becoming one of several dominant economic players, and the nation state is no longer that important. Uh, economies bleed over those boundaries and the nation state is no longer uh, the most significant entity uh, uh, to, in the terms of reference. The other thing that is assumed in the globalization story that you've probably inherited just from paying attention to the world is that uh, it's never been like this before. That is also not true. A hundred years ago, many historians have argued the world was more globalized than it is now. We are now, we now have all these treaties that uh, overcome these trade boundaries, but a hundred years ago, we didn't have trade boundaries. There was actually, many people have argued, depending on the evidence you look at, that there was a much more liberated free flow of commerce and exchange a hundred years ago than there is now. Other people have pointed out that the free exchange of global trade started about 2,000 years ago. Uh, with China and India trading with each other uh, across the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean and the Muslim traders over land of the Silk Road. Um, Venice became what it was as this fantastic city-state because of the trade with the East, mostly spice trade. Um, so the whole history of global trade started uh, arguably 2,000 years ago, uh, there was a moment of history that was dominated by colonialism, uh, which is another period of specific kind of globalization that was extremely transformative. Uh, and now we're back to China. Um, before, uh, during the colonial period, there were no such thing as currency exchanges. You couldn't trade U.S. dollars for, uh, for Chinese yuan. Uh, it just, there was no way to do that. What, if you were British, what did you do in the afternoon? Tea. Tea time. You drank tea. Where's that tea come from? China. Okay, so there's a lot of tea 
coming from uh, China to the United Kingdom. Was China a colony of England? No, but it had spheres of influence in China, like Hong Kong, Shanghai. Yes, and this is the story of how those spheres of influence and why those spheres of influence came into being. When uh, it's when it's tea time and you want your tea and you go to the store and there's no tea, it's a problem, right? And so it was very important for England to have its tea coming from China. How does England get that tea? It has to buy that tea. How does England get the money to buy that tea? They can't bring gold. They can't bring uh, British pounds. Uh, how do they get the money to buy that tea? They have to sell the Chinese something. What did they, the British sell to China to get the money to buy the tea? Opium. Opium. Uh, opium. Yeah, how do you know this? Just history. You guys don't teach, don't, you don't learn history, do you? High school. High school. OK, thank you, high schools. Um, so for those of you who didn't learn this in high school, uh, the British did what any self-respecting global superpower did. Is it, it harvested drugs in one country and sold them to the country that they needed the money from. That's what the United States did, by the way, in the 1980s when the CIA was uh, needed money to purchase weapons to arm the Nicaraguan rebels. We smuggled drugs, the CIA smuggled drugs from the Middle East uh, to purchase weapons to secretly and, and illegally give them to the, the rebels uh, in Nicaragua. Um, so, I mean, we still do this. This is just the way the world works. So what happens when the Chinese say, listen, um, we appreciate all the opium you're giving to our population, but we're trying to get some work done here. Our people are, are turning into potheads, losers. They, they just lie around in opium days, and we can't get anything done. You're destroying our society and our economy. Stop it. It's illegal. What's Brit the British response? Said, uh, we, we consider that an act of war. And our response is to blow your navy out of the water. Thank you very much. Thus started the opium wars in China. The British Navy, after a short defeat, uh, came back in strength, defeated the, the Chinese Navy, and found itself in control of Chinese territory. And so in that position of power, they negotiated uh, sovereignty over Shanghai, uh, outside that Chinese settlement, and, and made it uh, with, this was not colonialism per se, it was a treaty with Chinese to control the port of Shanghai, which became one of the largest cities in the world. And it was simultaneously a port where goods would be offloaded onto the piers, just like when we were studying the industrial city, um, and then reloaded onto other boats uh, destined for other places. It really had very little to do with China. It was just a very convenient, convenient place to uh, conduct business. So the port was here, and the offices of the increasingly uh, powerful and wealthy trading interests uh, be were just on the other side of this grand boulevard. What is the name of this place? The Bund. Who do we know who has recently redesigned the Bund? Mark Klopfer. <laughs> And so at the time, um, Manhattan looked a little bit like this. Uh, in a way, there was Manhattan, and there was Shanghai, and then there was everybody else. Uh, so this uh, actually compares quite favorably with Manhattan in terms of um, the architectural comparison between Manhattan and Shanghai. Um, the towers are just as tall or taller here. You're just further away on the other side of the Huangpu River. Um, so there's a lot of interesting stuff that happens in Shanghai. The Japanese invaded in 1942. 
and had big plans uh, that were very um, much influenced by the City Beautiful movement. Uh, the idea was to make it an imperial capital of Japanese China. Um, then communism, the communist revolution uh, in 1949, uh, Mao Zedong took over and uh, he basically said, you know, this whole capitalism thing and cities itself, they are very divisive of the social classes. And communism, the goal is to stop the segregation by class uh, boundaries. So the logical thing to do was to disperse the population out of cities. And so there was a very anti-urban attitude and a campaign against cities. So the Bund was evacuated and was left dormant for several decades during communism, uh, became storage space instead of offices of international companies. And the, there was a dramatic and aggressive program of rural industrialization. Every village needed a factory. Uh, so industrialization became an important factor, but not cities. It was industrialization without cities. Let's move to London. Uh, every city, uh, the three global cities are Tokyo, London, and New York. They are the top uh, nodes of international finance and exchange. One of the ways that London held on to that crown of one of the three global cities is it redeveloped its industrial waterfront into um, a node of great financial, uh, a central office uh, district of global financial interests. You see Citibank, uh, HSBC Bank, um, international finance and their towers is a symbolic instrument for gaining the attention of the world and saying, we are a global city. Um, La Défense in Paris, uh, again, was, a, was France's bid for global city status. Uh, and in 1979, when uh, Mao Zedong died, Deng Xiaoping famously opened up the <coughs> trade relationships between China and the rest of the world. And they needed to um, develop a symbolic center. So what did they do? They um, invited, they had an international design competition. And they invited the top architects of the world to design this new financial center. And, um, and so uh, the French architects said, well, what if we just took Paris and we put it here in China? Um, what would that be like? Um, and then they said, what if we put Manhattan in here in China? What would that be like? Uh, and out of that exercise developed these schemes for creating Pudong as a global financial center. This is their bid for global city status. And these international architects, you should recognize the strategy here as being uh, what Rem Kolhas and uh, Bernard Schumi did at the Parc de la Villette um, competition. This was a similar strategy uh, uh, for Pudong in Shanghai, Richard Rogers, uh, Fuxas, Toyo Ito. Uh, everyone got into the game. Um, <clears throat> there was one firm uh, in the competition. Uh, in China, if you go to architecture school, instead of doing a co-op at some outside firm, you basically are part of an architecture firm and the basically the co-op architecture firm design office uh, won the competition and took all the ideas of the international architects and combined them into what was then proposed and, uh, and what was then built, uh, including a replica of the Champs-Élysées, one meter wider than the Champs-Élysées. Um, to be symbolically uh, triumphant over even the French. And so uh, what was built today, here's the Bund, and here's Pudong, is basically the, the, the architectural imprint of two distinct periods of globalization. 
where the important functions of the port and the important functions of financial exchange are only part of the story. Arguably, a bigger part of the story is the symbolic, iconographic demonstration of power and wealth that is an operation performed by the architecture independent of the programmatic purposes. To the extent that the Bund actually uh, served programmatic function and had to be built in order to serve that programmatic function, and uh, supplied uh, an iconographic, symbolic purpose as a secondary factor, Pudong, it's reversed. In Pudong, there's no need for all this space, but we do need to establish China as an important global player, symbolically, through the expressions of our architectural urban demonstration of power. So I'm going to stop it there.